How to access the Emergency Response Data Platform. Any public safety agency can access life-saving emergency data through the Rapid SOS Emergency Response Data Platform. There are two ways of doing so. Rapid SOS Portal is a powerful web-based tool that enables you to manage emergencies and access location and supplemental data for every call in your jurisdiction. Signing up for Rapid SOS Portal is easy and only takes a few minutes. In addition to emergency management tools and data, Rapid SOS Portal includes a training platform as well as administrative tools to manage user permissions, track usage, and analyze trends in your agency. To learn more and sign up for Rapid SOS Portal, please visit rapidsosportal.com. Rapid SOS also integrates with every major CAD, CPE, mapping, or other public safety softwares. With an integration, you can receive Rapid SOS data through your existing workflow, and you won't need any additional screens, tabs, or windows. To learn more about integrations, visit rapidsos.com slash public dash safety dash partners. If you are stumbling upon this video on YouTube and it is after, I would say today, uh, June 19th, even though we were officially ending on June 21st, um, this will be the last live session. And if you would like access to all of the previous recorded materials from this last session, go ahead and head over to onscenefirst.com forward slash study, um, sorry, forward slash training, forward slash study ENP and uh, fill out the form there and you will be added to the Google group where you are able to access all of the recordings, the PDFs, as well as the MP3s and any practice exams and any other materials that I have since. Um, all right. My computer's acting wonky. Usually I'm on a much bigger screen, so I apologize. Uh, if you do want to be notified of any of the fun, cool things that I do on a regular basis, head on over to the website onscenefirst.com and go ahead and register there for our newsletter. There'll be one that's going out in the very near future. So if you want to head on over there as well, I want to say thank you to Rapid SOS, my premier study group sponsor. They have been with me since the beginning of the first session as we close out the um, last live session for now, and it is number eight. So lots of ENPs have come through the live sessions. Doesn't mean that I'm not going to have the materials available and update them accordingly. I'm just realizing that having a consistent day uh, for a period of time is proving to be a bigger challenge. And so I will continue with the study group. It's just going to be kind of behind the scenes. So if you and with that, I'm going to officially turn it over to the National Emergency Number Association Ontario friends, uh, Kate and Sharon. If you want more information or want to check out what they're doing on their website for uh, Nina Ontario, you can scan that QR code, head over to the website, um, and they are reachable over there. But I'm sure they'll give you the, their contact information at the end as well. So Sharon, Kate, thank you so much for joining. Um, I I can't remember who's sharing the screen, but if you want to go ahead, I'm gonna I'm gonna unshare my screen. You can share yours, and then whoever wants to go first, you can uh, introduce yourselves. I'm gonna go off camera. Um, because I just think it's awkward just sitting here staring at the screen. But um, I will be back once you guys are getting ready to wrap it up to, to leave off with a couple of other things. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so welcome, everybody. We had a few technical difficulties to start, so hope, hoping everything runs smoothly now. Um, just want to start with some introductions. Sharon, do you want to go first there? 
Um, sure. My name is Sharon Cook. I am an emergency number professional. I'm a senior consultant at Esri Canada. And prior to being at Esri Canada, I was with Large PSOP for almost 20 years. So I've been in the role of call taker, dispatcher, um, acting supervisor, and then also did a lot of project work. Um, lately, I've been focused a lot on the uh, NG911 initiatives and helping Canada get ready for NG911, which includes a lot of work spent with the Emergency Services Working Group, which we'll get to a little bit in a moment. And then I also just joined um, the the board for Nina Canada West as a director. So that's new and I'll learn more about that in the future. Kate? Uh, my name is Kate Patteran. I'm a communication supervisor of the Halton Regional Police Service for 21 years now. I'm also the Nina Ontario Vice President. Um, when I became a supervisor, I remembered looking for a course that could really teach me everything about 911. And when I saw the ENP exam, I knew that this was it. When I looked at all of the content, I realized this was an all encompassing course. So I studied, I wrote the exam, I had a much better understanding of 911, but I felt like I was lacking information about Canada and the way that Canada does things. Uh, so I threw myself into situations and tried to gain experience and learn from industry experts. Sharon and I connected last year, actually, it seems longer than that, Sharon, but we connected <laughs> last year. Both of us really felt a need to help other Canadians like us and to tie in Canadian content into the ENP program. So we talked to our uh, Canada Regional Director, Holly Barkwell, and she thought it was a great idea. We decided to join forces. We asked Tracy if we could join forces with her and tag along. So we're very grateful, Tracy, that you have let uh, your neighbors to the north tag along on this, this project. And just to uh, talk about the ENP program, here's just a quick snapshot of how many ENPs are in Canada compared to the US. Um, and I really love this quote, EMPs are industry leaders driven by a relentless pursuit of knowledge and a genuine willingness to assist others. And if you've ever met an ENP and you've asked them a question, they, it's not a yes or no answer. Like they're there to help, they're there to connect you to resources, they know people, um, and they're always, always learning. Um, Canada only has 61 EMPs currently, and so we're really hoping to grow this number and create more recognition uh, for this designation within the Canadian industry. And just a reminder, as we embark on this journey of learning and new technologies and uh, shaping the future of 911, there's going to be all kinds of new um, acronyms and abbreviations. And don't be intimidated by this. Um, you already know a lot. And so you're going to learn more. And just a reminder, you've probably already looked at the NINA Knowledge Base Glossary, but it is such a great tool, even before you go to conferences or to have along your way. Um, as you're going through the study group and, and studying it, it's an incredible tool. So let's get started. Here's a bit of an agenda for the session and just a bit of a disclaimer that not all of this is in the study guide or will be on the exam. Uh, some of it will also overlap with Tracy's content, but we really wanted to give you uh, paint a clearer picture of what's happening in Canada. Um, and just to give a better, well-rounded understanding of how 911 works in Canada. So uh, with that being said, we're going to start with the evolution of 911. And I, we like to call this 150 years in under five minutes, because we're going to kind of race through this. But it's really important to know about Canada's rich history in 911. So oftentimes when we talk about inventions and thinking of the, the new technologies, um, things can be underestimated. There's lots of resistance. Uh, in the case of the telephone, there was actually a lot of different people working on inventing this particular device and being able to transmit sound. So Alexander Graham Bell was very interested in this in part because his mother was deaf. So he did a lot of work trying to work on speech and communication, advocating for developments in communication. There were others working at it at the same time as well, um, including Alicia Gray, Miucci, who's an Italian, a few different people who were trying to get a patent off the ground for the phone. And uh, there's lots of different stories. And if you look into this, it's kind of interesting. But at the end of the day, Alicia Gray had his lawyer and Alexander Graham Bell had his lawyer and they were both at the patent office and the Alexander Graham Bell patent went through first. Um, so there was a lot of um, interest in that. And then, of course, different people wanted differences around that. And so it's become one of the most lit, um, litigated um, 
challenges in terms of a patent. There's been over 600 challenges to that patent. Um, in 2012, even in Canada, after there was a, a thing that happened in the U.S., they actually passed a motion in our parliament at the House of Commons saying, no, 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 Bell was the inventor. That's what we believe in Canada, and we're sticking with that. The very first words that were spoken on the phone were, Mr. Watson, come here, I need to see you. And this was way back in 1876. So in the early days of the telephone system, phone calls were manually connected by human operators using switchboards. When you wanted to make a call, you picked up your phone, uh, the telephone operator would plug a cable into a jack. These telephone operators who were predominantly women were known as the flow girls, and it was a great opportunity for women at the time. Um, eventually, the need for a more efficient and scalable telephone system led to the development of automatic switching technology. And in the pictures here in the top right corner, you'll see uh, a picture of a switchboard office or center uh, in Montreal, which we found, a little, tying in a little bit of the Canadian, Canadian um, pictures here. And then at the bottom is the central office. So, and that's where the automatic switching technology comes into place here. So how did we get to this automatic switching technology? Um, and I know that uh, Sharon probably touched on this as well, but uh, the inventor of the first automatic switching technology was an undertaker and inventor, Almond Brown Stroker. And he learned that his competitor's wife worked as a telephone switchboard operator and had been diverting business calls meant for him to her husband. So he received the patent for the automatic switch that eliminated the need for human operators to connect. And it was kind of at this point that we said goodbye to the hello girls, those switchboard operators. And um, the switchboard operator job became eliminated. Many women who had found economic independence were now out of a job. So there's a bit of a bigger story in history here as well. The first real line of voice communication to emergency services was the emergency call box. In the 1800s and early 1900s, these emergency call points were installed on streets. And you could see in a uh, picture to the left of Vancouver in 1906, that was the early radio there. Um, and this was meant so that officers, typically they would stand at the corner and then when the people needed help, they would approach them. But this allowed the officers to patrol their areas a little more. And then when the phone would ring, they would come back to the corner and answer and, and communicate back with their, their 911 center, or sorry, not their 911 center, their, their police uh, service. And then in May, 1960, Edmonton installed a state-of-the-art system with 400 bright red call boxes along major intersections and arterial roadways throughout the city. The system cost $100,000 at the time. It was the first of its type in Canada. Calls would go directly to the Edmonton Communication Center. So this was the beginning of communication to kind of a, a emergency center and over time it evolved. And so we know that uh, the 999 emergency number holds the distinguished title of being the world's oldest emergency a number and its origins are rooted in a really tragic event. November 10th, 1935, devastating fire erupted at the residence of an esteemed London surgeon. As the a fire tore through the building, a neighbor called, picked up the phone to talk to the operator to be connected to emergency services. And the phone rang and rang and nobody answered. As a result, five women that were sleeping in the upper floors of the building were killed. The Times later printed an article from this neighbor, who was also a doctor, complaining that the operator didn't answer his call. The delayed response prompted a government inquiry. So on June 30th, 1937, London's new emergency telephone line was unveiled. And a notice in the evening news to the right uh, showed people how to use it, how to dial 999. And uh, I like this, this quote here, uh, their instructions to only dial 99 if the matter urgent if for instance the man in the flat next to yours is murdering his wife or if you've seen a heavily masked cat burglar peering around the stack pipe of the local bank building. Uh, the 999 emergency number was initially launched for public use within a 12 mile radius of London's Oxford Circus but as the public became familiar with the system its coverage really expanded. So who was the first city in North America to use three-digit emergency dialing? Well it was a Canadian city. 1959, Winnipeg became the first city in North America to use three-digit digit emergency dialing, but it wasn't 911, it was 999. Services for 16 different municipalities in the greater Winnipeg area were combined. This eliminated 32 different phone numbers that people would have to call for emergency services. The original proposal included using male personnel 
at a wage of $345 each per month, but the municipalities were not happy with the operating costs at all. So Alderman, Alderman A.E. Bennett, who was the police commissioner at the time, suggested to hire nine female operators at a reduced salary of $200 per month. Uh, so he also stated that this arrangement will not affect the efficient operating operation of the proposed system. Uh, with that, it was accepted. And as a universal emergency number system expanded, so did a new employment opportunity for women. Again, one that provided economic independence and meaningful work. So I know Tracy talked on this a little bit about, uh, meanwhile, in the USA, we have Prior to 1968, there was no standard emergency number in the United States, and it was the National Association of Fire Chiefs that recommended the use of a single number for reporting fires. So February 16th, 1968, Alabama Senator Rankin Fight made the first 911 call in the United States in Haleyville, Alabama. And it was a bit of a race because AT&T actually had plans to launch the service in Indiana first, but Alabama beat them, um, becoming the birthplace, birthplace of 911. And so now who was the first city in Canada to use 911 instead of 999? We did a lot of digging on this, a um, lot of research. There was a lot of conflicting information out there, but we were able to find these articles that indicate that the city of Edmonton was the first to go live with 911 as the universal emergency reporting telephone number. And that was just so that they could... Um, have the same number throughout North America, have a standardized number. And Winnipeg later uh, joined, joined in and transitioned from 999 to 911. So we've put together a bit of a timeline. This sort of gives you some of the main cities in, in Canada as they went live with um, 911. And so you can see, like, sometimes I look at some of these and go, oh, wow, I can't believe it wasn't until 1990 that Vancouver fully had 911, for example. And so it, it was really been interesting going through all these different articles and just seeing where the history lies in Canada. And then just another thing to note, sort of like that 999, depending on where you are in the world, it's always interesting because it's not always 911. And we hear it so much in our media that we think that you go to another country and you dial that and it'll just work. Um, but it doesn't necessarily. And so in Canada, of course, we have 911, but if you happen to dial 999 or 112, those calls will go through to a 911 center. We just, of course, don't get any of the Annie Alley and the location information and that kind of stuff. But it's not always the same. And I think even in the US, and Tracy can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I found was in some states, those numbers might also go through to 911, and in some cases, it might not. So just a, you know, friendly uh, public service announcement when you're traveling, always just sort of look into that to see what the numbers are, where you're going, because our smartphones can do a lot more nowadays, but uh, it's always good to know what the numbers are. And another thing to note too, is that there's still some areas in Canada that don't have 911. And this includes um, up in the um, some Northern communities, um, some First Nations reserves, as well as remote fly-in locations. And then Nunavut as a whole doesn't have 911. Um, so in those areas, people have to learn the different numbers to be able to reach different emergency services directly um, when they are in an emergency. In uh, 2013, there was a boat crash in uh, Ontario that where um, three people were killed on this lake, and it really put the spotlight on where some of the gaps are in the 911 system. Um, and the, the coroner at the time made 18 recommendations that included, among them, uh, improvements to the 911 system in the area. So um, hopefully as the conversation keeps going with NG911, we can get to a point where we can get 911 to areas of the country that maybe don't have it today, but to be seen. In terms of the distribution of PSAPs, um, in Canada, there's just over 100 primary PSAPs, and then there's 135 secondary PSAPs. And this sort of just gives you the, I mean, obviously it's very population based as well. You can sort of see where the PSAPs are distributed throughout Canada. Uh, it's also important to note that we do have six areas in the country that have basic 911. Um, that's part of northern BC, a little bit, I think, in northern Alberta, Yukon, Northwest Territories, as well as um, Newfoundland and Labrador. So in those areas, uh, when you dial 911, you get through to the 911 center, but there's no any alley, any location like that. So um, yeah. Uh, this map here gives you a little bit of an idea of who the 911 network providers are going to be when it comes to next generation 911. 
um, in BC and Alberta, it's going to be TELUS that's looking after most of that. Um, Saskatchewan is SaskTel. And then the rest of the country is primarily under Bell. In the north, it's Northwest Tel that will be looking after that, but Northwest Tel is owned by Bell. So indirectly, it's Bell that's going to be um, dealing with that as well. At the moment, there isn't 911 in Nunavut, and, um, but hopefully that will be changing in the future as well. So stay tuned for what may happen there. So when it comes to NG911, I know there's been sessions about that already, um, but just in terms of Canada, our um, deadline in Canada for all the peace apps to onboard to the new EziNets is March 4th of 2025. And now that we're in 2024, that is really, really close. Um, so there's a lot of peace apps that have to get there. And I'll touch on that in just a moment on the next slide. But basically, it was the CRTC's telecom decision 2021-199, where that date was um, finalized. Uh, COVID did play a role in it, and things got delayed because, in part because of COVID, but there has been no change in the date to this point. So at this point, any peace apps that have been onboarded to the, um, the EziNet in their uh, areas are going to need to do that. So how are we doing with that? Um, basically, it was in March of 2022 that um, the EziNet or the Emergency Services IP networks went live in Canada, and that was in Bell, Telus, and SaskTel areas. Um, the first um, successful test call happened in June 2023, and that was with Toronto Fire. Um, the call was answered by the Toronto Police Peace App and then transferred to the production-ready testing environment for Toronto Fire. On October 23rd um, of 2023, Strathcona County PSAP became the first PSAP in Canada to transition to the EziNet in TELUS territory. So that was a huge milestone and everybody was anxiously waiting for the next one, which would be on, in the Bell area. And that happened on December 12th. So just uh, literally a month ago. Um, and there it was the Toronto Fire Emergency Communications that accepted Ontario's first call. So we're getting there. But if you remember the, the slide from just a couple slides ago, where there's like just over 240 peace apps, we're only at two. So we got a lot to do in the next uh, 14 months. Um, there's all kinds of different Canadian policies and legal frameworks that shape the development um, of our laws here in Canada when it comes to things. Um, a lot of it is, of course, influenced by the U.S. because we are so closely linked on so many things and have the same vendors and all that kind of stuff. So let's delve just a little bit deeper now into how things work in Canada and who's making these decisions. So just giving you a high level overview here, this is kind of the who's who. So the CRTC is the administrative tribunal that uh, regulates and supervises Canadian broadcasting and telecommunications um, for within Canada. So within the CRTC is the CRTC Interconnection Steering Committee or CISC. Um, this is the organization that uh, um, assists with the um, all the reports that get written and things on um, 911 and helping out the CRTC in terms of what um, recommendations um, the experts have in terms of 911. This is the committee that kind of presents all that to, our, this, to the CRTC. And it comes on the 911 side from the Emergency Services Working Group. So the Emergency Services Working Group is just one of a few different working groups that fall under CISC. And basically it is composed of people from the telecommunication service providers, PSAPs, um, 911 industry specialists. And basically it's that working group that advises um, on anything related to 911 service within Canada, um, doing reports, contributions, all kinds of things to come up with those recommendations that the, the CISC committee can then um, use. Innovation, science, and economic development, formerly Industry Canada, is a little bit similar to the FCC in the United States. Um, they do work with um, Canadians in all areas of the economy and parts of the country to improve communication, or sorry, to improve conditions for investment, enhance our innovative platform, um, increase our share of the global trade, build a fair, efficient, and competitive marketplace. Uh, it's a federal institution and it, it leads innovation, science, and economic development portfolio. Um, ISED manages Canada's airwaves, and that includes spectrum auctions for the different radio um, segments. 
sorry, it's been, I don't remember all the exact terms on that part, but that's where I would go back to the radio notes for that. Um, they also oversee um, bankruptcies, incorporations, intellectual property, and measurement systems. And they provide financing and industry research tools to help business development, import, and export. And they encourage scientific research. So how do things work in Canada? Who makes the decisions and how are they made? Uh, the CRTC, again, is that administrative tribunal. Um, they report um, to the Parliament of Canada through the Minister of Canadian Heritage. They're dedicated to ensuring that Canadians have access to world-class communication systems and promote innovation and enriching lives. Uh, they set the rules and regulations that ensure these services are delivered efficiently um, in, in the best interests of the citizens and that they are protected. Um, for 911, the CRTC regulates the telecommunications carriers who supply the networks needed to direct and connect those 911 calls, but they don't necessarily um, have that uh, oversight um, to the PSAP, and we'll get a little bit more into that as well. So again, already mentioned CISC and how um, they have the Emergency Services Working Group. Um, and this is basically the at the heart of it all when it comes to decisions in Canada with a lot of the 911 um, decisions that come out. The Working Group addresses issues that relate to the provisioning of 911 services. And right now, a lot of the focus in a lot of the Working Groups um, everything is organized into what they call task identification forms. And all these different numbers deal with different areas. Um, but the bottom line is um, the emergency services working group right now, the, the main focus, a lot of it is on NG911. Um, and if you're thinking, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. Can I get involved? And of course the answer is yes. And what you can do is just, you know, go to their webpage and then start looking through some of these different TIFs. Um, every TIF deals with different areas. So one that's of special interest to most people in a PSAP is TIF 83, of course, because that's the NG911 PSAP based considerations. So other ones will deal with the network side of things. Um, there's um, TIF 92 is the one that's dealing with the mapping and the GIS and what's going to happen when we switch to geodetic call routing. Um, so there's just so many different TIFs. And basically what it is, is just go through the list. You can read the reports that are in there, see the different areas and what they're going to try and do, and then find one that interests you and uh, figure out where you'd like to, to go and then just contact the chair. And they are always looking for more people to be involved that uh, want to contribute to that conversation. So again, already touched on Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, but um, the big thing to note there is they're the ones that are managing our airwaves. Um, they oversee all of that as well as things like, I've already mentioned the bankruptcy, incorporations, intellectual property, measurement systems. Um, so they also are looking out for protecting and promoting the interests of Canadian consumers. And we wanted to just share this chart as well. Um, and this is where I was sort of talking about how the um, the CRTC can control some aspects of 911, but they don't control everything. So a lot of these things come down to a provincial level. And so this chart sort of gives you a bit of a summary of which provinces have 911 legislation and which ones don't, who is the governing authority, um, where are authoritative sources, um, and then in terms of the GIS data that we're working with, um, are there aggregators working within those provinces or who becomes that aggregator? And then which provinces have levies and which do not? So a lot of different ways that the different provinces are looking at these areas. Another area to note that uh, plays a role um, sometimes is with um, the fisheries and oceans is the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard is the one that provides that frontline service 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, to um, protecting our, our waterways. Um, they are there for emergencies, search and rescue and all kinds of other things. But if you're wondering where those Coast Guard fit into, it's the fisheries and oceans. Okay, so similar to FirstNet in the US, Canada has an initiative uh, to provide secure voice and data networks for emergency responders and public safety personnel and to communicate with each other. So th there's a few little miscellaneous things in here we're just gonna throw in just to make sure that you have some awareness. 
And then we're going to talk about some distinct Canadian approaches and ongoing challenges in 911 services. Canada and the U.S. do things slightly differently, but overall we have most of the same challenges for 911. So some of the things that you've learned about in the U.S. will be a good background for the next few slides. The wireless E911 phase two. Uh, there's a few things, and again, going back to the CRTC's decision. Um, so there's a few things, few differences in how uh, Canada does things from the U.S. with their wireless phase two. Canada, the Canadian version uses the Open Mobile Alliance mobile location protocol for geolocation. So within that, it must include a latitude, a longitude, and a radius and uncertainty of 90% confidence for all wireless technologies. It also maintains routing information based on phase one information using the emergency um, routing digit, the cell sector, which is cell sector based. And the in-call location update uh, allows communicators to manually request an updated phase two geolocation. So that is the de facto kind of standard in Canada, but the CRTC is focused on continuing improve, continuous improvement for location accuracy as well. Several decisions since 2014 focus on monitoring and updating benchmarks. For instance, there is a current focus on the availability of wireless handset-based location technology that can estimate a phone's location using cell towers and on device data like GPS and, and Wi-Fi. So that location is getting um, closer and closer, like uh, finding people still our greatest problem. So if we could use a combination of both uh, cell towers and device data, then it gives us definitely a, a narrower area. And then let's talk about uh, VoIP. So these decisions were made back in uh, 2005 and there's two components to this. So 911 calls from fixed or native VoIP services, we treat those like wireline 911 calls. So we have an Annie Alley and we have a, we're able to selectively transfer those calls. Anything coming from a nomadic or non-native um, VoIP needs to be transferred to a third party call center. So like Northern 911. User, we do not in Canada, we do not allow user input the input of location on those types of uh, phones. So any call made from a nomadic or non-native, again, has to go to a third party call center and then they transfer it through. And if you work in a call center, you've taken these calls all the time um, where they're transferring callers. They're trying to kindly <laughs> and patiently give you the information of the location. And really, I know you just want to speak to the caller, but that's part of their, their requirement is to pass that information along. So we've also, of course, everybody deals with the multi-line telephone systems. And basically these are the communication setups that allow for multiple telephone lines to all be connected to a single system. Um, basically, so you can share lines and uh, only have as many lines as you think you're going to need. You don't have to have um, a line, an individual, whatever thing for everybody. Um, sometimes also called private branch exchanges or PBXs. Um, it allows businesses and individuals to manage all of these multiple calls simultaneously. It can make it easier to handle high call volumes, transfers between lines, and provide better customer service. But of course, they do come with some challenges. Um, there's already been talk um, about the U.S., some of the U.S. laws and acts. And so, of course, Kerry's law was one of those ones that... Um, came to be because of tragic circumstances. But basically the bottom line of what has come out of that is because um, her young daughter was not able to dial 911 when she was trying to from their hotel phone. Um, with Carrie's law, it, it's a requirement that you're able to dial 911 directly without any kind of prefix number first. You don't have to dial nine to get an outside line and then dial. You can just dial 911. And over and above that, also when the, a 911 call is made from within an MLTS system, it should be notifying on-site staff somewhere that um, a, a, a call was made. Um, adding on to that is Ray Bombs Act, and that's um, providing accurate dispatchable locations because nothing is more fun than when you get a call from a university or something and you get that one address and you're like, oh goody, now where is this call actually coming from within that? 
Um, so multi-line telephone systems um, have those challenges and Raybon's Act, the idea there is not only do you need to tell me, um, yes, this is the phone number that dialed, this is where it's actually calling from. So that can include things like the floor or the room or the office number or whatever it is that allows the responder to get to where that phone is, as opposed to the big, large building that has 150 lines in it or more. So in Canada, um, it's the CRTC that has recommendations and best practices around multi-line telephone systems. And actually last summer, they had a notice of consultation to hear from Canadians on what they would like to see happen. Um, a lot of the best practices that, that are there within um, are things that came out of things that are happening in the state. So sort of following some of the recommendations of Kerry's Law and Ray Bombs Act. But this is part of the problem is where CRTC doesn't have the authority to be able to um, regulate some of those other parts that are just beyond um, where, the, where their scope is. So if you wanted to have a look, um, you can check out on the uh, CRTC's website and it'll have those best practices and you can see what's up there now. Um, and, and stay tuned because we're going to get more out of whatever um, results or decisions come out of that uh, notice of consultation from last summer as well. Um, text with 911. This is a little bit different than what happens in the US. And, and part of the reason that this would that um, things were done this way, it came out in 2008-8, which was the um, telecom public no notice. Um, and basically, the approach from a technical standpoint in Canada was using, yes, um, SMS was the preferred method for texting with PSAPs. But we wanted to also be able to get that location information. And so in order for that to happen, basically, what happens is a person that is deaf, hard of hearing, or speech impaired um, needs to identify and register themselves as um, needing to be able to text with 911. And then what happens is a voice call is initiated and the class of service that is shown will either be TXE or TXF based on the language that uh, the person uses. And then once that call hits the 911 center, as long as that center can um, process that call, they will initiate a texting session uh, with the call that um, with the phone that has placed the call. So this um, screen here shows the like if you um, Google text with 911, this screen will come up and this is where a person can go and register. Uh, it's not available universally across Canada. Um, not all PSAPs have this. So the PSAPs that do have this, um, this is where you can find out if the area that you're in allows for this. Um, so the caller can go there or the, the citizen can go there and check and register their phone accordingly. And then what happens on the call taker side is when you get that call and you see that text, um, that TXE or TXF class of service, that is the prompt for you to begin a text session with that phone. So you actually end up with the two different pieces happening at the same time where you have the phone call as well you're texting that device, but it's you that starts that. Um, if you were to dial um, 911 is it, or not dial, if you were to enter 911 is the place that you wanted to text, um, the services in Canada would um, send a, a bounce back message saying that you need to call 911 because we don't do texting directly to 911 in Canada right now. Um, with real time texting and NG 911 coming, those kinds of um, options will be available in the future. So stay tuned for that. I believe the tentative go live date is in. Um, the spring of next year for text with 911 or sorry for real-time texting so um, you can follow along emergency services working group there's a tiff that is dealing with that directly um, to get us ready to be able to do texting in canada okay moving on to canadian law um again this this area is only five percent of the exam um it's important to know that some laws are at the federal level, some laws are at the provincial level. So kind of take note of that because there may be some questions about that um, on the exam, what level of government um, uh, the law is. Um, and I encourage some of these really overlap. So personally, I didn't spend a ton, a ton of time on this, but I, I tried to focus on what the themes were uh, of, of each component of this. So the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom is, is the big one. It focuses on individual rights, fundamental freedoms, equality, democratic rights, official languages, and legal remedies. And if you look on the left-hand side, it kind of put the themes below 
um, the title of each of the headings here, just so that you could kind of like, if there's something related to that, a question related to that, then you can kind of um, make an educated guess in terms of what, what area it falls under. Um, so again, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom is founded on the principle that recognizes the supremacy of God and rule of law. It guarantees the rights and freedoms of Canadians in society. Um, freedom of, you know, religion, thoughts, beliefs, opinions, expression, peaceful assembly, freedom of association. And it's really focuses on equality, equal protection, equal benefits, um, and English and French share equal status, rights, and privileges. The Canadian Human Rights Act, uh, think of theme words, again, it overlaps, but equal opportunity, anti-discrimination, and prohibitive grounds, employment practices, harassment, federal, and it's at the federal level. Um, so equal opportunity without discrimination is a really real focus of that. Um, it deals with provision of goods, employment, selection and hiring criteria, and also harassment. The Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety Act. So anything regarding safe and healthy workplaces is probably going to be about directed uh, to this, this area. So it is a crown corporation owned by the government of Canada and it serves as the primary agency uh, for ensuring safe workplaces. It's governed by a tripartite council representing government employers and workers. So they work collabor collaboratively together and they aim to make credible information on workplace ha hazards widely accessible to promote a healthy and safe work environment for all Canadians. So any questions about healthy, safe workplaces, you're this is probably the area you're going to be focusing on. Uh, the Constitution Act, uh, part of the Constitution of is part of the cons part of the Constitution of Canada. Pierre Trudeau was actually involved in patriating the Constitution and introducing amendments to the BNA Act so that we could um, have our own act in Canada. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms forms the first 35 sections of this act. And successful EMP candidates should be aware that there's federal and provincial legislation that applies to your particular area. And the next page, uh, again, Canadian Canada Labour Code, just be cognizant that that has federal jurisdiction. Uh, Employment Standards Act is provincial to territorial jurisdiction. And again, that varies from province to province. Employment Equity Act is focused on equality in the workplace and Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So that's respect immigration to Canada and granting refugee protection to persons who are displaced, persecuted or in danger. And then the last page, uh, Canada has two federal privacy laws enforced by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. So there is the um, Privacy Act, and there's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is uh, a mouthful. Um, so the two, the main difference between these two, uh, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, are rules for, on how for how businesses handle personal information, and the Privacy Act is how the federal government handles personal information. So that's kind of the difference between the main difference between the two. And again, I included some kind of themes and and highlights here for to differentiate between the two and then there's also the access to information act and that's about public access to government records um just the public access transparency principles limited exceptions and then there's independent oversight as well so uh, take uh, take a read try to um identify different themes throughout this so that when you get to those questions you can make that kind of educated guess based on on your knowledge Okay. So that's sort of the end of the, the the main sort of Canadian pieces, but we did also want to just take a couple minutes to, uh, you know, encourage you to be involved um, if you aren't already. And I mean, even by becoming an EMP and studying for this exam, you're already probably hearing about the different ways. And, and I know Tracy has talked about some of these as well, but there's so many different ways to get involved with Nina. They have working groups. You can help with writing standards, um, thinking of how the industry is going to go and what directions it should take. They also offer courses, webinars, lots of opportunities for networking. You can join a local chapter. There's two chapters, I think, in Canada now. There's a few um, provinces that are still um, 
don't necessarily have a home, but you can then find a home in one of those other provinces. Um, just talk to any of the, the executive in either place. Um, conferences are another really good way to get involved. And then just a couple of the unique NINA groups to keep in mind. There's a, a Women in 911 that, that uh, is really trying to help um, women in our profession um, make that difference and, and to get ahead and to work with each other. And so within that group, there's webinars, there's meetups at the different NINA conferences. Um, there's opportunities with mentorship, they have training and they have leadership development as well which kind of leads into this team initiative, this transformative empowerment and mentoring program. And again, this program is a six month program. And basically what they do is they pair up mentors and mentees. And then once a month, there's a meeting for the entire group, as well as separate group for the ones that are wanting to be mentored and the ones that are the mentors. Um, and then there's biweekly meetings just between the pairs as well um, to, to offer the those help and assistance um, in, in trying to grow yourself in this career, in this profession. So there's a lot of, uh, we've touched on some some groups as well outside of, um, well, within Nina and outside of Nina to get involved. Again, the Emergency Services Working Group, if you're not sure where to, where you fit in, like reach out to us, we can help you out. Um, it's a really great way to get involved and, and it can be overwhelming at first, having your done your EMP exam will really prepare you um, for all of the new terms and everything that you're going to hear, but just, just listen and absorb. Um, again, Nina has a ton of things. There's the East and West chapter, um, or not East, I guess, Ontario and West. Uh, we're just starting uh, our conference planning for Nina Ontario. So if you're looking to get more involved, reach out to me. We're going to be putting together a conference committee. And I believe you get points as well towards uh, your EMP certification. So great opportunity to, um, to get some points to get more involved. There's also the National Training Collective, if you're involved in training at all. Uh, the National Training Collective, uh, run by Susie Tubner uh, out east, she, uh, they have meetings, I think, once every two weeks, and they work on developing training content um, for, for 911 centers across Canada. Again, there's APCO Canada, and then there's CSIPS, which is um, more, it's a, a bigger organization. It's good just to be aware of it, but it's um, something, it's a collaborative organization um, with Europe and, and everywhere. There's also the Canadian NG911 Coalition, which I believe is, is run through the Association Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. I don't know much information about it. Sharon, I don't, I'm not sure if you do either, but um, there's lots of, lots of ways to get involved. And if you could flip to the next slide, I had a few people reach out. Um, they wanted to make friends with other people, that other Canadians that are also writing the exam. So if you're interested in connecting with your fellow Canadian ENP study group friends, send me an email and I'm happy to put together like a WhatsApp group or something so that you guys can all work together. Um, it's kind of nice to go through this with, with someone else. I didn't know at the time that a supervisor from Hamilton was going through it, who I knew quite well, and it would have been really great for us to, to be able to work together. So I definitely encourage, you know, making those networks bigger and, um, and I can, I can help coordinate that for you. And lastly, um, you're here because you're curious. You're here because you want to do more. You're obviously somebody that is a doer and a helper and you want to make a bigger impact on the 911 industry. So we really love this quote, be a small fish in a big pond. Uh, continue to learn, continue to get involved, offer what you can, learn from those around you. If you have any questions, reach out to the big fish, but don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid to join those bigger groups because that is, is truly how, how you learn. Be curious. And that's There's it. There's so many good people that will happily guide you along as well. So don't be afraid of all the words. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Tracy, that's, that's all we have from a Canadian perspective. We thank you very much for allowing us to, to participate in this. I love it. Thank you. I love the way you put it together too. Um, a lot of great information. And while we don't know how much Canadian information is on the exam, we do know there are Canadian pointed questions. So I love that we were, were able to do this. And I will get the PDF from you guys to be able to attach with um, the information that I will be sending out 
But yeah, I, I beyond appreciate what you guys did for us. I don't see any questions in the, um, in the chat. I do see one of our, uh, app, our need, the, our on scene for a scholarship winners from Canada. So Terry is in the audience there. Um, and that wasn't even planned. It was just really cool for someone from Canada to be able to receive one of, one of our scholarships. That was the first time it happened. So it was just, this was all meant to be. So <laughs> yeah, super, super happy about that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen again real quick. If I can find my presentation. Oh, where did it go? Boy. Okay, that's weird. All right, well, we'll let that one go. It was just going to have my contact information up there. Um, it doesn't seem to want to be, let me try one more time. There it is. And I'll leave my contact information up there as well. If anyone should need to contact me, you can use the quick contact QR code there or email me at tldridge at onscenefirst.com. Um, like and follow us on social media. And in that lower right-hand corner, there is an On Scene First Safety Net Facebook group if you're a first responder and want to join us there for some tips and tricks on mental health and wellness, join us there. But if nobody has any questions, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Don't worry, you will get all of the materials in the next couple of weeks. Um, I appreciate you and all that you do. And until next time, heroes, stay safe, stay strong, stay here. We need you. Thank you.